I'm here with James Grind. He was originally identified just as James in the New York Times, and he is an abuse victim of ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. This is a heroic moment for James to come out and to tell his story and also reveal a lot of things that we never knew about ex-Theodore Cardinal McCarrick. So, James, thanks for being here with me today. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. I uh, am really appreciative of your generosity to let me come here today. And I hope to uh, reach out to many people and have them uh, save some souls today. Good, good. Yeah, I, I saw your your speech that you gave uh, outside the USCCB that was put on with Michael Voris and Alan Keyes and a bunch of other people. And I was really impressed by that. And uh, I just see an example of heroic virtue in you and coming out and talking about something that's that's not comfortable, but it's absolutely important. And really the conversations that we're having as Catholics right now in America and globally are thanks to you who came out and told your story about years and years of abuse under Theodore McCarrick. And before we talk about that, and you share your thoughts about that, I'd like for people just to be introduced to you. So who is James Grine? Oh, I'm James Grine, who uh, had a pretty good childhood. Now I have a, uh, a really great life. At 33, I stopped drinking and using drugs. And I really turned to Jesus Christ to help me to get there, because there was no person on earth who was ever going to help me stop using my uh, my garbage of uh of, of alcohol and drugs and i was able to join into a, a a fellowship of people who understood exactly what to do and i followed them and today i uh, live a happy joyous and free life i teach tennis to kids and i let kids know that they're perfect the way they are and that they're really really good and i make them smile and laugh and have fun because that's the childhood I always wanted to have, but was stolen from me. And so I make sure that no kid ever will feel exactly the way I did. And that's my mission today. Praise God. Praise God. So you talked about your your childhood being stolen from you. When did that happen? It started when I was uh, 11 years old. Um, McCarrick came to the house. McCarrick was a very prominent part of my life. A uh, very prominent part of my whole family's life. He had been part of the family since uh, 1950, hmm. um, or probably the 40, probably 48 when he met my uncle, my mother's younger brother, at Fordham uh, University, and they did everything together. Hmm. And my grandfather uh, adopted him basically because he had no father, and so he became the very fabric of the family. So how did that happen? How did you said he was kind of symbolically adopted. How did he meet him? He just met, he was a seminarian or a young priest or? No, it's uh, so my uncle Warner, my youngest uh, uncle went to school with him and they became great buddies. I see. And he brought, and uh, my uncle brought McCarrick home to uh, my grandfather's house in Teaneck, New Jersey. And my father, my grandfather immediately loved this man, you know, and said that you can do anything you want to do, and I will pay for everything you want to do. Wow. Well, yeah. All schooling, anything you want to do, and, and you will come with us on vacations. My grandfather was from St. Gallen, Switzerland. He was a uh, person I just want, who... I just want to pause uh, here. I just want to pause here. St. Gallen. Yeah, St. Gallen. Important. Very, very important. Very, very important because uh, um, the connection is was started back in the forties. He was he went to there. He went to Saint Gallen to meet my grandfather's work friends and his holy friends and his uh, anybody that you know. Saint Gallen is not a very large city. And it was my grandfather knew everybody. And so that he introduced McCarrick to everybody. Uh, and in fact, he went there on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, probably for 20 years. And he has a, uh, you know, a maturity with many friends there. 
The idea is that uh, the, the door was opened for him in St. Gallen, probably in, I will say when he went to, for a language school in 1951, my, uh, my aunt explained to me, he came back from, uh, from that trip and his whole life had changed completely. It seemed that he took that language school and ran it. It was uh, in a, uh, a monastery and uh, his whole life changed. And that's when he changed from being a, trying to be a parish priest and just being a, uh, a regular to becoming a, uh, somebody who wanted to ri rise up into the Catholic Church and into the hierarchy. His whole life changed. And he used my grandfather to uh, introduce him to Spellman and then Cook. Now, this is really key that it begins in St. Gallen. And we know that there was a St. Gallen mafia. And this, this really goes into the 90s. But before that, there's this connection with McCarrick in St. Gallen. Do you, see, do you see that there's a organic connection between McCarrick's work in the 50s and then later on with the conspiracy, they say, to remove Benedict the 16th? Yes. I've known this. And I felt this for a long, long time. And when you, uh, when you gentlemen started to talk about it and uh, listening to your, iPod, uh, your podcast a while ago, back in, in August, I just connected my dots with yours and said, praise God, somebody's starting to talk about this. It is so important because this is where it all starts. Uh, Benedict was not was forced to be resigned, was forced to resign, guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, at my parish in Texas, do you hear the echo, James? I, okay. At my parish in Texas, there's an elderly Swiss woman, and she says that when she, she was near St. Gallen, and as a younger woman, she remembers that the there was rumors of the clergy being corrupted in St. Gallen and that in the eighties and especially in the nineties, they brought Freemasons in to the college there where McCarrick was studying and, and basically de Catholicized the Catholic university there. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's where, uh, your mafia has started, and that's where uh, all the plans have been laid to bring Francis into uh, the, uh, the papacy. I mean, what we're seeing here is McCarrick's not just a peripheral person. This is ground zero. The other thing in, in my video with Tim Gordon, where we talked about the St. Gallen Mafia, we stated incorrectly in that video that McCarrick never went to St. Gallen, that he was associated with all the names, but he wasn't one listed as being in those meetings. But what's, what's incredible is I talked to you and I talked to this Swiss woman, there is a connection with McCarrick. In fact, his connection predates all their connections. Correct. All of it, all of it changes. He was, uh, I, I now believe that he was a predatory man for all his life. And uh, maybe it started in, in 48 when he went there the first time. And uh, then that's when he changed his mind from being a parish priest to go and get, trying to get into the hierarchy because these people said that's the only way you can gain power. And I don't want to say this too much, but uh, McCarrick had a, a, had a pretty good ego. He had a pretty good idea that he needed to be in power and that he needed to be, uh, you know, you know, 
the number one person at all times. He needed to be the number one person in the room all the time. You can look at that in all his uh, homilies and anytime he came to one of my family functions, he had to be the most, uh, get, get the one with the most attention. He loved that. That's who he is. Right. What do you think about his connection with Cardinal Spellman? There's, you know, it's not really a hidden news that Spellman was homosexual and had maybe some predatory actions during his ministry as well. Well, Spellman was uh, very influential in his life. He's the one who uh, really started to teach him how the whole system works in the United States. How do, how do how do you get ahead? How do you uh, how do you push yourself to be in the front of the room? How do you get yourself to be uh, to to rise in the hierarchy? How do you do that? And uh, the way you do that is to be charismatic and to catch the attention of everybody else, and then start to push yourself harder and harder. And it's all surrounded by that wonderful little word called money. Yeah, and he was a, a well known for his fundraising. <laughs> I've I watched that firsthand many many times. You know um, now, I'll, I'll mention one name, and that's Conrad Hilton. Uh, his wife, he and his wife, Hotel were, Hilton. Yes, were very uh, generous to him. Um, there was a time when I was at the Beverly Hilton in the eighties. Sorry, in the 70s. And uh, he was speaking to a group of 14 people in the room. And uh, at the end of his little speech, they all just opened up their purses and wrote huge checks to this man. And I was just in awe. And, and we go back to the hotel room and he goes, wow, that was a big take. Okay. You know, it was uh, hundred thousand dollar checks were written that day. Yeah. Now I'm I'm curious. Like you're traveling with them, you're back at the hotel room. What's the relationship here? I mean, he's a family friend. I mean, how this goes back to you're what eleven years old. So it started when I was eleven, and it lasted for eighteen years. Now, what I wow. you know the. When I become an adult and I become uh, more of a uh, uh, stronger, bigger, stronger man than he is, uh, he still has an incredible tie into me on my mind. He still has the, he groomed me well enough to know that I needed to be with him as much as I possibly can. While he was not really sexually abusing me, he was making me sleep with him because if I didn't sleep with him, um, he was going to tell on me and and he was going to ruin me completely. And so he was, you know, through coercion and through, uh, you know, blackmail, he just says, you have to be with me. And uh, I'm the best thing you've ever had. Um, sorry, I just had to uh, close my mind and get out of there. So it, he was very, very powerful when you when I was 11. And through all my formidable years of just starting to grow up, he groomed me to a point where I needed to be with him. It was important for me to tell him everything, go to confession with him only, and to, uh, to confide everything I had with him. And that way, I was very, very close. And I was shut off from everybody else. And so that... In essence, I lost faith in the church and gained only faith in him. And that's the way he prayed on me for many, many years. And so that his coercion on me was that if you don't do this, I will do that. And what that is, is anything from I will destroy you, I will uh, uh Make you wish, I was just going to make you wish that you didn't say anything about me. All the way up until uh, the last time I saw him in 2012 at my mother's funeral. I told mm. him that if he didn't come and say my mother's funeral mass, I was going to open my mouth. 
Well, he was under sanctions now that I know that. But he came and uh, he said to me at the end, at the end of the lunch, he goes, don't you know how powerful I am? I am the most powerful man in the United States. Nobody can touch me. And if you say anything at all, you will go down. You're going to be the bad guy. It's impossible for me to go down. So when I saw that article on, Jan- on June 20th, thanks be to God. Now, that was the another accuser that was in New York City in Manhattan. Yes. And it was in, I believe, in 1971 where he was fondled by McCarrick. Correct. So you read that and you said, oh, there's a crack in the dam. Yes. Let's let the water flow. I hit my knees immediately and thank God. And it took me uh, took me two days to get off my knees to go talk to somebody. And finally, I was able to tell my brothers and sisters who I tried once before and they would they they didn't want to believe me. They didn't want to hear it. I don't blame them. Uh, in that uh, I was finally going to be free. It was my turn. It was my turn. And it's, it's so good. How huge it is. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, you hide all this stuff because if you tell somebody else, who else is going to do this to me? You know, uh, you hear all about the, the trafficking now. Thank goodness I didn't tell anybody because I could have been trafficked everywhere. Those poor kids that were in uh, Pennsylvania, you know, and, uh, and it's all over. It's all over Syracuse, New York now, too. Yeah. So I've been pretty busy. Did you ever? So ahead. Did you, I'm sorry. Did you ever have the sense that, that there were others? There were obviously other young men who were being preyed upon by McCarrick. Were you aware of that? Yes. Or did you think you're the only one? I am not the only one. So I, on our trips to uh, to Nor- uh, New York State, a bunch of us would go, and. Uh, I have not been able to find the Rileys yet. I think they were firemen who perished in 2001. A sad thing. Um, Because there were, there were, there were four of us who would always go and uh, go to the fishing camp. And were you aware of the the beach house that we've that we've all heard about? I was aware of it. I was never invited, thankfully. <laughs> okay. That was, I was I was for a seminarians, you know, and that's uh, that's his greatest greatest deal that uh, he could pick and choose anybody he wanted to. Yeah. The, the, his he he was done with me because by that time I was too old for him. He likes younger men. See, did you get the impression that there were other priests, bishops, anyone in the hierarchy that was aware that he had this double life? Every one of his secretaries had to know. In Metuchen, in Newark, even when he was in uh, with Cook in New York, had to know. And I know that. Uh, there are some prominent uh, there are some prominent politicians who know also, and because uh, I was introduced to them as somebody of interest, I know that Cardinal World knows, and uh, and that's was that was that was just. Uh, the day that I met Whirl at the Hilton in Washington, D.C., right after he was uh, made uh, the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., was uh, a very hard day for me to take. I'm going to stay right there because it's in my, it's in my case that needs to be quieted right now. Yeah. What did you think when Vigano came out with his first letter and he just opens up all this information on McCarrick, including information about him going to China 
and then rehabilitated by Francis. Was that a, a good moment for you or a bad moment? How did you perceive that? That was, that was an incredibly great moment for me. I have found another saint, a saint who's on the inside who really wants to stand up and do something that's right for this church. Jesus is church. You know, I'm trying out here on this side to do something, and I have a man who is brave enough to stand up inside. And I think that we could do double whammies. He could do one inside, he could do one outside, because I have a lot of information. It was a godsend, absolute godsend. When I read that, I went and found so much information on the web to find out who else was talking about him and how credible he was. And when so many people came out in favor of him, I just thank God. I just said, please keep on speaking because we need you to speak. At that time, I was not permitted to speak because my case had just left my house. And now that my case has uh, been put many places, I have the permission from my lawyer to speak. And uh, it's, it's about time because I have an important message. So with Vigano on the inside and me on the outside, it's very, very good. Good. Uh, Vigano says that Francis knew, Benedict knew, um, the Apostolic Nuncios knew, that Myers and Newark knew, Metichin knew. He names a lot of names. Were you surprised by that, or did you know that they all knew? I knew that they all knew. I knew that John Paul II knew. How does that make you feel about John Paul II and Benedict that they knew? They, uh, I'll take John Paul II first. John Paul II changed his, his needs. He needed money. He needed his, his, uh, his papacy to uh, be raised up. He had a lot of projects that he wanted to do. And the only way he was getting any kind of money uh, donated to church was through McCarrick. And he didn't want to shut that off. And so he, while he knew he needed, he needed McCarrick as his tool to get as much money into the papacy as possible. How much money are we talking here? <laughs> 500 million, maybe. 210, we know for a fact. 210, we know for a fact. But I know for a fact that there was much more coming from the, the Hiltons from the uh, and from the left wing agenda in the United States. Yeah. And so that uh, it was a it was a faucet. And uh, John Paul did not want to turn off that faucet because he needed that money to uh, in all of the or of feeding the poor. It was no longer really feeding the poor. It was making him uh, his legacy much stronger and where he can be, uh, he can expand into, into more countries. Now Benedict didn't like that. Wanted to tie up all the loose ends because he saw through what, what John Paul was doing and he needed to say, well, this has got to stop. We are part of a, a church. We're not part of a money gaining uh we're not looking for power here through money and so so benedict really wanted to tie things together and he got the best guy to do it you know he tied up every, all the loose monies that were in the united states across the world he got them all together vatican, vatican bank. bank vatican bank you got it and he pulled it all together and uh a lot of the 45 million or the 55 million that was pulled out of the united states and and brought to the vatican bank is almost and I've talked to uh, AGs about that. I've wanted to talk to uh, some stronger men in the United States uh, about a, uh, a RICO investigation on that because yeah. it's definitely wa laundering. But that's another story. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to put a, a video, James, I'm going to put a video in the right corner. And this is the story of Benedict and Vigano with the Vatican Bank. I didn't know the information about McCarrick, but it gives all the other information if people are interested in how all that worked together. And I do want to go back to McCarrick in Newark. I once visited Newark, and I was told that John Paul II made their cathedral a basilica. 
Yes. Which is odd because it's, it must've been some favor, right? right? <laughs> it was a favor. The other thing I was told is that McCarrick, before he was a Cardinal, all of their bishops are called excellency. He was allowed to be called your grace. His grace. Is that true? I guess. Before I, he was, I, I never called okay. him anything. You just call him, uncle do you call Ted. him uncle? Uncle Ted. You call him that. Yeah. So it's not a rumor. That's what his victims call him. Uncle oh, Ted. Yeah. If you could talk to every one of my sisters and brothers, they say the exact same thing. Okay. Were they shocked when you told them brothers and sisters? Um, not really hmm. because they, my sister, well, I have a sister who's a couple years old and three years old. And she was shocked, but, uh, she's okay. So I have an oldest brother who, uh, uh, wasn't shocked because he, uh, saw a lot of things, but, um, my oldest brother, who's 11 years older than I am, is, uh, you know, wasn't really shocked. I tried to tell him back a long, long time ago, 27 years ago, but he couldn't put his arms around him. I guess he couldn't hear it at that time. He was probably too busy working. Uh, he said that now that, uh, I, now that all this is coming out, it makes perfect sense to what he saw. And my, my sister, who was two years older than I am, now makes much more sense to her. And my little brother, uh, who's two years younger than I am, uh, saw it all because he saw me growing up. And he saw how, I, how my whole character changed. And he couldn't believe it. I was a y nice young kid who could do everything. And all of a sudden, I became a mean, angry little boy. And he yeah. didn't understand why. So it affected the entire family for a long, long time. Yeah, it still does, I'm sure. It started when you were 11 years old. And when did you finally have the firm break? Um, when I was uh, 29. That's the year I got married. Okay. And... Uh, my mother wanted him to say my, the mass at my wedding. And for my mother's sake, I did. Oh, wow. McCarrick said, uh, I have three brothers and three sisters. McCarrick said uh, six of them. Wow. So that's how close. He's, and, he's and practically he a part of the family. That's right. He, and he baptized all the, all the grandkids. Amazing. So as, McCarrick, as, as it is, I am the very first kid that McCarrick baptized. When he was a priest, when you're his first priest. baptism. I was, I was born, I was born three days before he was uh, ordained a priest. And so it was mandatory that he, uh, he baptized. And uh, so I was his special boy. Sure, and I had to. I had to do everything he wanted me to do because my father, my father, you know, trusted him, trusted him, trusted him, trusted him. Is your father still alive? Unfortunately, no. Okay. No, he died. What uh, would he have? What would he have said if he had found all this out? I think he knows exactly what's going on today. I think that he would have said to me, he would say to me, James, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. But your biggest problem you've ever had in your life is now your largest asset. Let's go after him. Wow. Cool. You know, it's, uh, I pray to my mom and dad as my guardian angels every single day. And it's just part of my, my way of thanking them for raising me so well. It's, uh, it's important. Wow. It's amazing that you ha have your Catholic faith. Well, to be on the receiving end of so much abuse by arguably the most prominent cardinal in the United States, if not in the world, one of the most prominent. And yet you still pray the rosary, go to mass, go to confession. Love Jesus Christ. 
It's how so, is that possible, James? Explain that to us. How do how do we understand that? It seems to me that I would hate the church, hate the hierarchy, hate everything about it. How do you have faith? I hate I hate what is happening in the church that I grew up in now. I hate the new mass. I hate the uh, the rewordings of of uh, all the prayers. I hate what they say now. I say the old stuff. And uh, and so that, uh, you know, sometimes I just have the mouth of the words. Uh, There is a when I hit uh, my recovery in in 1991, I was told by another man who had stopped drinking and stopped using drugs that I needed to turn my life, my will over to the care of God every day. And that maybe, maybe he will return me to sanity. And that the sanity is that I don't need to use anything outside of my body to make myself feel good. If I open myself up to God, he will give me everything I need. And I watched this guy for a long, long time. And that's what has, he was walking his talk. And I watched him and how easy he was gliding down the road. And he had a, uh, he had a disability. And how can Paul do that? And, and then Paul says, well, I do that because Raleigh does that. And Raleigh says, I do that because Frankie does that. And, I, and Frankie says, I do that because Bill does that. And I said, well, I guess I, if I want to hang out with you guys, I have to do that. So for uh, 1,287 days, I've been doing it. Amen. I get up this morning, I get down on my knees, and I ask God to keep me away from it, everything. And not to hurt anybody, especially myself, as I turn my life into will over to the care of him. Because it's with him that I live. It's without him that I die. And it's not necessarily that I perish. It's that I'm cut off from his good words. And that's how I live my life today. Have to. Jane, that's so awesome. God bless you. It's inspiring. I mean, if, if, you can, if you can say that and you can stay clean and you can stay on the path with Jesus as his disciple, who can't? That's right. He, he, he has the supernatural power to redeem, to heal everything. It's powerful. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Absolutely. There, there have been so many miracles in my life that uh, I can't count them all. It's just amazing. Yeah. You know, one day, so his first miracle is one day I wanted to drink and kill myself. The next day I didn't. Where'd that come from? Right. So. Did you have a moment where you said you had kind of strayed from the church? Was there a moment when you said, I'm going to go to confession? I'm going to, was it that same time period where you said, I'm getting off drugs and alcohol? I'm going to find my way. That's exactly correct. Um. Wonderful. Now, McCarrick was part of my early sobriety, which is weird. Hmm. Anytime I got in trouble, anytime I needed something really bad, I needed him to uh, guide me on a few things to make some dis- help me make some decisions. I'd always call him. So when I uh, uh, I needed him to find me a a place to live after I got out of uh, a detox center. And he says, that, well, I have this friend named uh, Bernard Law. Let's go over to his house and maybe he can help us out. <laughs> and so uh, Cardinal Law puts me in this house in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Now, this house is uh, run by the Catholic Church. And it's for men who are uh, trying to get back into life who are coming out of the state penitentiary. And here I am coming down from on high, and the, and the Cardinal's telling them he's coming in and he's going to live there, but he has no criminal record. So I'm in there with the, uh, the murderers and whatever, but it didn't matter because that's where I wanted to go. I needed to go. That's the only place I good. could go. It was good for you? Yes. Because it showed me where I could have been, but for the grace of God, there goes I. And it showed me that if I continue to drink, if I continue to do stupid things, 
I was going to be one of these guys, and I didn't want to be one of these guys. So it was a it was a godsend. It's all part of it's all part of his plan. All part of his plan, you know. And I'm blessed for that. Did I like it then? Probably not. Did Did McCarrick see that your anger and your drug abuse and alcohol abuse was related to what he inflicted upon you as such a young man? He had to have. He had to have. Did he express it to me? No, he didn't really express it to me. My father would always say, uh, you know, I wish he would just stop drinking. And he would, and, uh, uh, Oh, I don't know how I could possibly help him with that. Now, I remember having conversations with the three of us standing there, and I just I would just deny that I would, I would have a really bad problem. But my my father knew, and McCarrick and he said, "So well, I don't know what we can do. We have to wait." So, uh, did he carry any guilt or remorse? Absolutely not. He That's the strange thing is. This is a man who has terrorized the lives of young men from New York City to New Jersey to Washington, D.C., priests, seminarians. And we haven't heard anything of repentance from him. Nothing. 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 He is a, a weak man. So, as I said earlier, that... Uh, Without him, I die. So I believe, I firmly believe that McCarrick has stopped believing in Jesus Christ. So the new thoughts going into his head of how he should be repenting, how he's really living his life. He's living a life of a lie and he has lost Jesus's input to his own body. So he has no clarity of what he's supposed to do next. And that's why they sent him away. And that's why he needs to go pray and a penance. And is he really doing that? Mm. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. Did you get the sense that he, I mean, he lost his father as a young man, I read. Is he a narcissist? Is he, uh, does he have mental problems? I mean, what, how do you become sociopathic like this and live with a double life for decades? So, the only thing, I've thought about that for a long period of time. And uh, this summer has really started to become more clear to me that he was an uh, egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And that he always needed to be in front. And if he wasn't in front, he was going to fight his way to be in front. And that he was going to do anything for anybody to be a people pleaser. And when you become a people pleaser, you stop thinking about anybody else and you're just doing it for yourself. And so that was he born that way? No, I think he changed completely his first trip to San Gal. Yeah. When he when he when he was uh, preyed upon or found out that he had gay tendencies and that he enjoyed that so much. And that's how he proceeded and pursued everybody. And he wanted and needed to, to fulfill his needs. And he preyed upon the weakest person possible, the ones that he could get away with the most. And I was that, bro, that boy. Ah, yeah. It, it said that he knew five languages. Did he learn that in St. Gallen? He, uh, and, he had a couple at uh, uh, Catholic University in Washington, but mainly in St. Gallen. Now let's go back to St. Gallen because this is the break. I mean, this is huge. As we Catholics are trying to understand, why did Bennett the 16th resign? How do we have predator priests all the way up with red hats on their head? This St. Gallen piece is starting to break open, and I think you're onto something, James. And I, I want to explore it a little bit more. He was a priest. He baptized you. Did he then go to St. Gallen, or was that? How does it fit into the time frame? 
He went to St. Gallen before, uh, first off, before he was even a priest, he went to St. Gallen the first time when he was in either high school or last year of high school. No, I believe it was uh, Fordham University. And so that, uh, that's when my uncle Werner and he were best friends. And that's when my grandfather basically adopted him and said, you can do anything you want to. And your grandfather was in Switzerland. Well, my father, my grandfather is hundred percent Swiss and he's, he had his first shop in St. Gallen. My grandfather, uh, invented the bra and girdle. Okay. So great contribution to the world. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was obviously a man of means. If you invent the bra and girdle, he had it's successful, means. obviously. Yes. He had the means. So, so yeah. Theodore Marquera comes to St. Gallen to study. Your uncle, who's Swiss, is studying there? Yes. They, they become good together. buddies. Good buddies. And then they are introduced to your grandfather, who's a man of means. And he says, hey, I'm sponsoring you for your life. I like you, kid. Theodore McCarrick. You can be anything you want to be. So and he was bankrolled from the beginning. Bankrolled from the beginning. And this, people, everybody watching this, this is the origin of the St. Gallen Mafia. It yes. has to be. Yes, that's true. It has to be. It has to Unbelievable. Be. There's providence in this, James. The Holy Spirit is at work. We are, we are scratching the surface of something really big and terrible here. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You know, if, if you had not, so he's, if you had not explained to me what Vigano had said and about the money laundering and all that other stuff, these thoughts never would have come back to my head. So it's a, it's one, one great, one great idea deserves another great idea. And, and then so he goes and he studies. studies the, I'm sorry, I interrupted. He studies in St. Gallen. He gets associated with your family and their wealth. And then he decides to be a priest? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And that uh, it was, yes. And my grandfather would go back to St. Gallen every single year for probably 15 years. And he always went. Sometimes with Who's my he? uncle. McCarrick? McCarrick. McCarrick, yes. McCarrick would always go. McCarrick would go to every vacation that my grandfather went on. He was with him. I mean, there, there, there are family pictures that I have that my sister has that he's, he's, he's in everything. He's like he photobombs everything. You know, it's just, uh, it's amazing. And my oldest sister can really, uh, you know, uh, say this is so true because she remembers it so much more than I do. She's 13 years old than I am and uh, realizes his, uh, his influence with my grandfather and uh, how important he is because uh, now he's going to be a man of cloth and he's going to be there for us all the time. And, and your grandfather was a Catholic, I presume? Oh, absolutely. So he probably loved that his adoptive kind of a son, foster son is going to enter into the priesthood. Uh, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, he's now special. You know, and so he was, uh, my grandfather knew Spelman and Cook. Personally. And, personally. And he introduced them. That's amazing. I've always thought that McCarrick's origin with Spelman set him on his path of a success and predation. Correct. The idea is that you have to learn how to manipulate the system. And being a, uh, a money grabber for uh, Cook really gave him, and, and Cook not really paying attention to him at all, really gave him the opportunity to find all the different little cracks and crevices where I could possibly get away with things and really start to gain money. And I could put some of that money probably away for myself, i.e. when he... Uh, uh, had his own uh, his own apartment in the Upper East Side in New York City when he was with Cook when he could be living in uh, Cook's mansion, but he was he had this other place where he used to take me, uh, you know, 
there are a lot of secret things that McCarrick had that uh, he was getting away with because nobody was watching him. And it's the perfect cover because if you're a priest, Monsignor, Bishop, everyone just opens the door, rolls out the carpet, writes the checks. So he's the Monsignor. When he, when he becomes the Monsignor, you know, then, then the, my family goes, oh, wow, he's a Monsignor. He's really growing up now. Let's, uh, let, let, let's introduce him to uh, other people that we know. You know, I, uh, my mother and father raised seven kids. And uh, we weren't the wealthiest family in the world, but we weren't poor. But, you know, my father had some great influence with a lot of people in, in uh, New Jersey and New York and then in California. Um, so it helped him a lot. Uh, McCarrick really learned uh, a lot of, uh, and, and it was introduced to many, many people. As soon as he uh, got to meet uh, uh, the, the Hilton family, uh, then he learned about the Hearst family, and then he learned about all the cat, all the all the actors, actresses in Hollywood who I was introduced to. An amazing list of people. Amazing. And he, he was, was traveling, traveling quite a bit. All the time. He was traveling on the guys that I'm raising money for the poor. And that he was, he needed money for the poor. Um, well, I won't say that. I don't think they gave a lot of money to the poor. I think they gave a lot of money to themselves and they used the guise of, uh, of the poor always. It's always how we're going into South America. We're going into Africa and uh, how these, these, uh, these, these small, uh, uh, communities need money because, uh, they have nothing. Uh, I used to know the story perfectly, but I don't anymore. It's a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, game that he played. So he played everybody in the room to give him money, and he played his uh, superiors by giving them the money so that they would leave him alone. And he was there in the middle, and he got to do anything he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do was prey on young people so that he could enjoy, have his own ideas in his own little world where he was the king of the world where he can just prey on and, and take anybody he wanted to and that nobody could possibly could possibly grow better than he and as it progresses as it progresses he's introduced to some of the most powerful people in the world and the most powerful people in the world believe him they don't know what's behind the mask and those of us who knew who were, what was behind the mask, the Viganos, the James Grinds, and the other people in the world were too afraid to come out because he would kill us. Literally. He's associated, like you said, with movie stars, politicians, important politicians. How did he attain that? The... Politicians really started in Newark, New Jersey. He became uh, very connected to the senators there. And that uh, he had uh, received an inheritance from the, 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 the Hilton family where he would donate money to their campaigns. And when you donate lots of money. So to he was privately party, donating to... Senator campaigns in Newark. Yes. Republicans, Democrats, who are we talking here? Everybody? Everybody, but mainly, uh, yeah. mainly, mainly the liberal side. He was, McCarrick is a very liberal man. Yeah. I mean, my what father, would he say? My father I mean, was a very conservative man, and they used to argue all the time about that. Really? Yeah. When you traveled with him, was it first class? Was it fancy hotels, steak dinners? What, what was... Was, was, did he even try to hide it or was it flamboyant? I mean, not flamboyant. So when we traveled together, uh, he would be in business class and I'd be in coach. That's okay. Because that's all I could afford. 
That's all he's saying. That's all we can afford today. That's fine. I didn't want to sit next to him for long flights anyways. Um, but we would stay in uh, residences. We would stay in uh, uh, the Cupola Hotel in, New- in Rome, which is uh, around the corner. I would stay there. He would stay most of the time in the Vatican. Um, there were times when we would uh, go towards... Uh, he would always keep the middle, the, the, the middle, the middle section of hotels. He was never really that flamboyant, no. And he would always, uh, he would buy, always buy dinner. And he'd always make me buy breakfast, which was easier for me. I stopped <laughs> right. eating breakfast after a while. Right, right. Back to the politicians. This is really interesting because you see him with the Clintons and the Careys and the. Kennedys and the Obamas and he's connected with that upper sphere of influence. Yes, he is. Well, I'll just say one word, globalization, open borders and the idea of migrants. And when you hear that the Pope is uh, really needs to, uh, you know, address these, uh, uh, you know, climate change versus, uh, you know, sexual abuse. Oh, that, that kind of made me do a backflip. Um, what did you think when Cardinal Supich in Chicago said that we don't need to go down these rabbit holes? We need to look at global warming and immigration. On a long bike ride of anger. <laughs> Who was, I, I, I really wanted to find a way to connect him to something. I haven't been able to do that yet. Because the man just doesn't get it. You're talking Supich. Supich. Yeah. Who's becoming, I mean, it was McCarrick was the number one kingmaker, and then it was Whirl, and now it seems to be Supich is the new. Is the, is the new McCarrick. 2.0. Yes, he is. 2.0. Yes, he is. Uh, there's no doubt, because uh, Francis needs an ally. And, in America. In America. And McCarrick is too dirty. In world, world. Oh, world, absolutely, very dirty. So he needs somebody who's a lot cleaner. I, and I guess Supic has uh, been able to keep himself relatively clean, except for the uh, the flag that was taken down and burned. And burned. So, do you think that uh, was McCarrick actively involved in politics while he was in D.C.? How how instrumental was he? But Carrick was part of the uh, Department of Justice from the Clinton presidency through just a uh, second year of, of Obama. His personal lawyer is part of the Department of Justice. How influential is he? You bet. He knows everything. He can fly anywhere in the world on a diplomatic passport and just whisk through things so that he could just go anywhere he wanted to do and do anything he wanted to do. That's why he went to China. He was able to get there. And McCarrick says that, oh, you know, uh, the president or the, uh, whoever he is of, of China say he has the same uh, same interests as we do. You know, he wants to uh, have climate change. I don't think that. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Come on. It, it's, it's sad what they're going to do in China. It's really sad. It, it every is, time, it's happening. Yeah. Every morning I I uh I come downstairs and I read, you know, one Peter five or or uh or or complicit clergy and I read this stuff and I just sometimes I have to just go for a long run because I'm so angry. Why are these people doing these things? They're still doing it. And or but finally they're being exposed. I know. Yeah. You know, James, I've met McCarrick twice. The first time was in 2006. I had just come into the Catholic Church. I'd been an Episcopalian priest, and I was brought by a donor to his office to introduce me so I could be ordained as a Catholic priest, maybe by him, didn't know anything about him. 
and I had a meeting with him. And he was very cordial, warm, charismatic, but there was something about him that was a little bit creepy. I was, I think I was about 27 or 28 when I met him. And then I met him again at the Catholic Information Center. We invited him to give a talk on China. The place was full. And he spent the talk, which was about 30 minutes to 45 minutes, on how we need to recognize the, un, the communist official Catholic Church and not the underground suffering Catholic Church. And during that talk, people were looking around like, is the Cardinal saying what I think he's saying to support the communist state Catholic Church? And that's, that's what, what he was, was saying. saying. That's what he was saying. And people in the Q and A were asking, "Are you saying we need to support the official, above ground communist Catholic Church?" He says, "For the sake of unity, yes." And so when I read in Vigano's testimony that he went to Rome, met with Francis, and then flew and told Vigano, "I'm going to China," and flew to China, and then shortly thereafter, Francis recognizes the communist Catholic church that has McCarrick's fingerprints on it. I guarantee it. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's, uh, it's an order from St. Yeah. So it's everything that we read today. Everything is connected. Everything. And what is the role of communism in this? Well, it's, it doesn't want to believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't want to believe that there is a, uh, a, a, a being stronger than I am. There's, not, there's no power stronger than I am. It's political atheism. Political atheism, basically, yes. And that money is it. And they're trying to gather as much money as possible so that they could take their elite people, put them up here, and the rest of us can perish. They want they're they're, they're a money gathering group, just as uh, I see it across the world today. Are you familiar with the story of Bella Dodd? I read her book. You read her book. Do you think McCarrick? is somehow related. I mean, it's before his time. It seems Cardinal Spellman w- does fit the dates, but is that kind of thing of infiltration happening? And do you think McCarrick could have been tapped in St. Gallen as an infiltrator? I know he was tapped in, uh, in uh, St. Gallen as an inf- infiltrator. I know. it. Yeah. Why else would a man go to St. Gallen so often? Every year. Every year. To be, to be uh, educated. He didn't need to be educated. He was there to, to learn other things. Had to go. Nobody goes to St. Gallen just for, once you go, you don't have to go again. I'm sure it's, I've seen pictures. I'm sure it's a nice place, but it's, it's not the French Riviera. No, it's not. It's out in the middle of nowhere. So you fly to Geneva and you get on a train for an hour and a half and you, and you, and you get off the train and you go, oh, what a lovely place. Yep. <laughs> so if we go back and look at um, the influence of St. Gallen being the epicenter of the Antichrist and how they have finally forced people into doing things that they don't really want to do. Things are happening faster today out of St. Gallen because they have gotten impatient. They've waited a hundred years for their turn to step forward. And it's not happening as fast as they want it to. So Benedict was cleaning up and they said, no, no, we can't clean up because if you clean up, we're toast. Sorry, we're done. And so we need to have somebody who can come in and uh, help us. And so we can carry out everything that we need to do. 
And if you go back to listen to what McCarrick said about he was he was approached by some very significant people that he knew and that needed him to uh, bring up uh, uh, Francis. And uh, Probably, let's yeah. let's let's politicize <laughs> this. In the video where he, he says a prominent Italian gentleman suggested to him Bergoglio. Dude, who could this be? Is, it, is this Italian gentleman a cleric? Politician? I'm, I'm scratching my head on this. I don't think it was Italian. I think it was Swiss. He just ah. covered it. I so see. that you couldn't connect the dots. Gotcha. Or... It would be if it was an Italian gentleman, then it was definitely a politician. Mm-hmm. But he says, "Oh, so, uh, uh, you know, an influential man. Did he know? Him? Well, he, you know, he may have been passed a note. If you don't do this, uh, you know, you're, you're out. Right. These people are very, very powerful. Uh, the the agenda of the United States." Has been had been uh, for many years for uh, you know changing the climate, changing uh, opening up our borders, and letting a mass migration come. Through. Socializing, Socializing public social services, services, medicine, everything, everything. everything. So uh, and also when and so that the idea is that that. The United States is the most powerful country in the world. And if they can get the United States to do that, then they can come forward and take over the entire world with communistic agenda and be in power. That's what I believe that they had have in mind for themselves. And that's what they want to go forward with. But they haven't been able to do it because of what Bella Dodd said is that because of the patriotism and because of uh, the belief in Jesus Christ. And we need today to rise up and have ourselves believe in Jesus Christ more than we've ever lived before in our lives. And we need Amen. to rise up right now because patriotism is with our president who is there today. And he's really trying hard to give us a chance to step up. And we need to, as Catholics and as anybody, need to step up and say, enough is enough. Yes. We Amen. need to be ourselves. We don't want somebody to tell us what we can and cannot do. I lived that way for 18 years. I don't want to go back ever. That's right. Amen. We serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So it's time for me. It's time for me to speak loudly and saying that we cannot let them get away with this. They will lie. They will cheat and they will steal from you everything they possibly can because they don't want you in life. They don't need you. You know, self-centeredness to the extreme. Is this common amongst other bishops? And I'm sure in your experience, you are around bishops, cardinals, monsignors. How widespread is this filth, this rot of narcissism and abuse? And just money. I mean, the underbelly that you've described in the past hour. How common is this in the clergy? It's quite wide, widespread. So McCarrick used to uh, uh, take some of his slush money from uh, whenever he traveled any place. And he would always give the, the uh, whomever we visited, he would always give them the white envelope. And I always ask, what's in the white envelope? Oh, just a present for, you know, the people who are- Some holy cards. cards. <laughs> yeah, holy <laughs> cards, yeah. <laughs> Benjamins and uh, and Jacksons and uh, you know you know just just holy cards for them so that they can uh, be rewarded for uh, you know for for their service. Uh, their service was basically to uh, to hide what he was doing, hush money. So I was uh, I was abused. So you're saying when you went to a meeting, there'd be a white envelope with with another. Cardinal or a 
for a cardinal or bishop, a bishop, bishop. or a priest. Or, okay, you know, there'd be an envelope so with the, money. Or, or the person's uh, secretary. You know, he, he would bring at least one envelope every place we went. And he abused me many times in Chicago. And so mm. the predecessors in, in Chicago, I knew pretty well. And uh, he was he was always giving out white envelopes in Chicago. So you can put that together. Um, the, the idea is that... Uh, he was not afraid with most people, with most cardinals that we visited in Los Angeles, San Diego, um, Chicago, that he would give them money in order to, uh, to, to be well. And so I read parts of that uh, a couple of days ago, how we used to give out money in the Vatican too. I said, "Wow!" So it's not so far fetched when you when you read it. Yeah. You, you have these thoughts, and then the next day you wake, you wake up the next day, and you go read it. Go somebody else is saying the exact same thing. So you know he's he's a uh, he's a creature of habit. He does the same thing over and over again, and we know what that is. Yeah, he's insane. I, I, I want to ask a hard question, and that is. Did John Paul II know about this? Was he getting envelopes or was he just not aware of it? I mean, so many of us are asking, all of these bad things started happening going back to 60s, 70s, but the 80s, they seem to get worse. Did he know? Yes. You think he knew? Okay, wow. Wow, it's explosive. explosive. Yes. That, that was, was one of the hard, I love the Vigano part one testimony. But after I read it and all the fireworks went off, there was this little pain in my stomach that said, this goes back to John Paul II. It's not a, just something that happened in Francis. No. This has been happening for years. You know, John Paul didn't, didn't, uh, didn't make it go fast enough. He, uh, he was part of the agenda, but he did make it go happen fast enough. He changed a lot of things in the church, but not as fast as the uh, the people behind wanted. And the people behind are the people in San Gallo. They had the agenda. They had the orders. Yeah. And so that. And like people in San Gallo were like Cardinal Martini of Milan, Cardinal Daniels of Brussels, Cardinal Casper. Daniels is a big, big man. He's a he's a messenger. He's not the man, but he's a he's a strong messenger, especially going into Belgium and going all through uh, through uh, through Europe, and and he's loved by many people. I uh, have some strong ties with fr with friends in Belgium and in Germany and in uh, and, and uh, the Netherlands who have uh, basically said, "Yeah, I remember that guy." And his his messages was always the same. You know, you need to give. You need to give. You need to give. You need to give. Not listen, just give. They didn't really have a message. So one thing I will say about McCarrick is that when he went to the pulpit a lot of times, he would say some of the best homilies I'd ever heard in my entire life. He could write one up and he'd do a really, really great job. And he would get almost people in the, in the whole church to want to stand up and, and give him a, a round of applause. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the two-faced thing. It's, it's, it's the guy who wants to sell you something that you don't need. So. Did, what, did he have friendships with other cardinals in New York, L.A., in Rome? And also, was he? What was his position towards then Cardinal Ratzinger? Foe, friend. I can't go there. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. So he had many friends. His his best friend was in Chicago. Okay, and he would he would uh, he would always uh, when I was uh, I, I would always meet them in Chicago. I mean, he introduced me to some crazy people over there, too. But uh, um, we'd always go to this the one famous uh, Italian restaurant downtown. And there were some pretty, pretty wild people in there. 
that's where I le- really learned how to drink. They, they taught mm-hmm. me how to drink the Italian way. And like, Holy cow. Uh, early gifts of uh, drinking. Um, I'm going to say this about McCarrick. He's a two-faced man. And while he can, he can look at you and you, he can make you believe that he's okay. Deep seated. He has other agenda behind everything. He has, uh, he's a chip on his shoulder about something. And, but he's very charismatic and he's able to bring an incredibly great story and it can make you cry at the drop of a hat. He did for me also some great things. He taught me how to meditate. He taught me how to pray. He taught me get, how to get into the presence of God very, very quickly, which I use today. But we, he also taught me some grave things, really terrible things. How to not trust anybody else. How to not love anybody else. How not to, uh, to be one amongst fellows. To always guard myself and how to cut myself off and how important it was for me to be not genuine with everybody. And that hurt. That hurt my life for a long, long time. That's why I'm not married. That's why I don't have children. And that's why I'm, uh, I'm alone a lot. But uh, I'm pulling myself out of that now, this after this summer, and finding the truth within myself. And within my recovery program, I have I surround myself with some of the most incredible people who have a belief in God stronger than mine. And uh, I'm also hanging out with some people who are survivors from Pennsylvania and from New Jersey. And these people are all trying to contact me. And uh, we're, we're going to start a little group and start to understand all the pains and problems that we had in our lives and how we can go conquer them. So from this really, really bad situation comes good. And, uh, and that's why I believe that I had a reason to talk to you. So I talked to George Neumeier, who I've chatted with many, many times. And I said, you know, uh, I need Dr. Taylor Marshall's number. Okay, James, I'll give it to you. So he outed you. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But it was it was good because I get to talk to George on a friendly basis. And I have more friends now than I've ever had in my life. People, very influential yeah. people, which is amazing. One great conversation I had this summer was with Boniface Ramsey. Oh, what a man. Great. Brave. He was he was one of the first. He was a uh, guardian. He was one of your guardian angels before he even knew it. it. That's correct. So I just called him up out of the blue and he couldn't believe that I was calling him and I couldn't believe that he was answering his phone. And, uh, we just started to talk and he goes, you know, I'm, he goes for a while there. He was, uh, and I think in our third conversation, I said, Bob, I said, what you need to do is you need to start talking until somebody listens, just keep talking and talking and talking, talk to the media, talk to the newspapers, talk to everybody until somebody listens, because somebody's going to listen and you're going to become a saint. Oh, no, I can't do that. Come on. You just keep on doing it. And lo and behold, here he is. You know, it's, uh, and we still talk to each other and, uh, and just exchange niceties. But it's but he was for people who don't know, James, tell tell people who Father Boniface Ramsey is. I think everyone who watches my show knows who he, who's he is, but maybe new people. Who is he? Boniface Ramsey is a uh, parish priest in New York City, but he was uh, one who wrote uh, a letter to the nuncio to uh, complain about McCarrick's uh, abuse. He was uh, a, he was a uh, head of the seminarian, and he knew about what McCarrick was doing, how he was preying on seminarians, and he needed he needed to draw that attention to somebody. But and he sent that message to, I guess, the guy in O'Malley in. Uh, Sean in, O'Malley. In, Sean O'Malley. Sorry, I don't. I don't and O'Malley didn't open his. He didn't open the mail, mail because O'Malley thinks he's uh, too important to uh, to do anything like that. And uh, so Cardinal O'Malley uh, missed out on a, on a great opportunity and uh, made them change, uh, you know, their policies there. 
So there's 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 a lot to Boniface Ramsey really opening up the door to why the communication problem is still there. It implicates people. It's a very, very important first step for us to, to move forward and, and to dig a little bit deeper. And Boniface Ramsey has an incredible sense of right and Jesus Christ. So he and I talk about Jesus a lot. And he has an incredible understanding of how important this is and how important it is for his congregation to give me hear the word of Christ every single week. It's very, very, very cool. It's amazing that he took up the pen, even outside the, his diocese, and saw a prominent cardinal and blew the whistle. And it also shows how the hierarchy blocked him Well, they're all implicated. They're all connected. And so that, you know, the Tobins and the O'Malley's makes me so sad how they all got white envelopes. I'll go off offline with you and show you the list of people who received the white envelopes. Is this global or is it just America? Oh, no. It's, uh, as we were, it used, sorry. As we're seeing now that it is more global and, it, and, it's, and it's a persistence. So the amount of tr- trips that the character, he was a globetrotter. He went everywhere. And his influence is everywhere. And where did he get the first idea? He got the first idea in Switzerland. And he needed to uh, rise above everybody else. And he was the most important person. And he was given, uh, you know, carte blanche everywhere he went. And he influenced everybody. And so that they can do things. And when they changed the laws, and then when they changed the laws from, uh, oh, homosexuality between uh, underage people. They, they used to be 18, now it's 16, and now it's gone back to 18. But, you know, they bend the rules as much as they possibly can because he bends the rules. Mm-hmm. And so if he's doing it, oh, well, I'm doing it, you can do it also. And you should, you should start to groom your people because we need more people who to become uh, priests of this church. And we need more and more modernistic people. So it's McCarrick who started it all. It's amazing. And, and just the connection with your family in St. Gallen is so important. And I bet in months to come, years to come, this is going to begin to unravel. We're going to see what happened there with the Cardinal Daniels and Martini and Casper and Lehman and Basil Hume in London and Cormac Murphy O'Connor, all of these St. Gallen guys were McCarrick friends. Yes. And money. Money. Lots of money. Lots and lots of money. And people don't know that the Papal Foundation which gives millions to the Pope, was started by McCarrick, correct? Yes, the first, yeah. So he, he got, he, he had uh, prominent people in the United States, uh, you know, uh, say that I'm going to contribute $100,000 a year for the next 10 years. And he, and he was uh, grooming those people to become, uh, you know, the money donors. And he was offering them something, I'm sure. Not just... Uh, not just, you know, your donations, but he was giving them something. I don't know what that is, but you have to sell somebody something. They're actually just going to give a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Well, they got to meet the Pope. That was part of it. That's true. But, you know, you're also yeah. speaking about the people who are, uh, you know, the, the Hilton levels. People. Right. For a hundred thousand dollars is a lot more than what we can do. Mm-hmm. You know, I put out a tweet when you were speaking at the outside the USCCB meeting this fall, 
where the USCCB voted against pursuing an investigation with McCarrick, asking the Holy See to release files. And there's a picture of you, and I said, if the bishops were courageous, they would have this guy in there in the hotel addressing them instead of Cardinal Mahoney or some other joke. If they had done that, James, if they had said, we want to hear from you, what would you tell the bishops of the United States of America? I wanted so badly to be in there. <laughs> um, that they needed to come clean with themselves to tell us. You don't have to tell lay people outside so you're implicating, but you have to tell each other exactly what's going on. You know, you have to, you have to, you have to uh, repent to God, to yourself and to another human being and keep it all in here. It's fine. But you have to come out and say, you're right. Everything that we've done has been corrupt and we need to stand up and we need to have new people speak for us rather than people who are not trusted anymore. And there are probably five or six guys that I trust. Um, amongst the bishops. Amongst the bishops, who I've spoken to many times. I think that uh, the guy down in Tyler, Texas is pretty cool. Bishop Strickland. Yeah, Strickland. I like him. Yes, yeah, so I like him a lot. He and I had a conversation, and he just started singing, say, saying the rosary when he was driving out to do a, uh, uh, do a mass. It's incredible. You know, out of nowhere, I call him and he talks talks to me. Uh, yeah, he knows exactly what's going on. I need him. To, I need him to rise up, and I will speak to him more. I haven't spoken to him in, a, in about ten days. Um, so they need to repent, and not necessarily to us, but to each other, because they're not talking to each other. About what's going on. But what about what about the lady though? Is it enough? I mean, they need to speak to the James. The don't James you think? know though. All right, so I know, but but don't you think they need to say, eleven year old James Grind, we are sorry. Yes, they need to do that. But Karen, that sorry. I think it's a matter of charity. It's a matter of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Say we failed you. We are, we are sorry. Something was stolen from you. Something was crushed. And we are sorry. I, I pray for that every day. Yeah. I pray for that. I life. like how you, 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 you said, said repentance, because as you were saying, I was like, this guy, James, sounds like Vigano. Vigano is talking about repentance and, and turning to Christ and salvation of souls. He talks about other things, but that's the number one. You know, we could go through all kinds of policies at the USCCB, but if we lose our souls or those bishops lose their souls, that's the greatest tragedy. And so repentance and finding new life in Jesus Christ is the number one priority. And then everything else will fall into place. True. I think that we need a new church. Explain what you mean. <laughs> I think that uh, I, I think Francis should re, uh, resign. And I think what would you say to him? I would say that you know uh, you lost you lost your power in Jesus Christ a long time ago when you started to cover up and and you you changed you started to worship idols rather than Jesus Christ. And when you replace Jesus Christ with uh, predatory uh, homosexuality and or uh, a new agenda that was adopted to you, or you became um, a product of his own environment where he grew up in, in, uh, under uh, under dictatorships, he lost his ability to really um, bring himself forward. He doesn't have the ability yet. He needs to go back and be re-educated. Yeah, he, he might have the official authority, but what you're saying is, he drew away from his moral authority. That's correct. As have all, all, so all bishops and all cardinals need to go. Those who are good will come back. Those who are not will not, will not be accepted. And as, as uh, Francis said 
yesterday that all homosexuality needs to be out of the church. Oh. <laughs> he, uh, I, I agree with him. Yeah, let's get rid of everybody. And because uh, uh, it's not a place. It's not holy. We're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. And homosexuality, uh, marriage, and unions do not do that. So in the Bible, it doesn't say anything about having a, it has St. Peter, but it doesn't have any cardinals or any bishops. So I would have a very flat organization as a person who is on top with the parish priests. And, you know, I, I can figure out all the logistics things also, because that's what some parts of my, uh, of my, uh, you know, professional training. Um, but uh, that's what it would be. Well, some people have said on that note, some people have said, and I, I rather like it. And that is, yes, have bishops, but have them multiplied by a thousand so that the bishop really is more like a parish priest. Over, a bishop is over 3,000 people and not 3 million people. So against the mega diocese and be more like the early church where a bishop actually knew the people in his town. Exactly. Exactly. That much, that's much, much better. You know, it has to be because they, they're so, they're so uh, disillusioned by and what's distant, really going so on. They're so distant away from us. So I need to rid out, I, I need to get out uh, uh, other priests that are in the, in the, uh, in, in the church. I've had the opportunity to go back to church and I ask, I usually hang out after mass just to go ask the priest uh, a few questions. I ask them whether they know who I am. Oh no, I don't really read the news or anything. Okay. And then I ask them the one main question. Do you believe in Cardinal or in uh, Archbishop Vigano? And it's a yes or no question. And mm -hmm. if they're no, then I know they're part of the problem. And I'll never be able to talk to them. I'll never trust them. Right. If they say yes, then, uh, then there's, a, there's a possible seed that this would be okay. That I would come back to that church. So, um, Wasn't it interesting at the USCCB that there was hardly any conversation about Vigano? You would think if the Archbishop Nuncio of America called out all the cardinals and even the Pope that there'd be some discussion, but it was ignored. It's, it's strange to me. Yes, because uh, they know that he, ha he was carrying all the weight and they, they, they couldn't open that up because the conversation would be, uh, you know, that's why they can't repent to each other. They don't want to, they want they don't want to talk about the obvious situation, the obvious it, it can't happen. You know, so Vigano was not um, was not demoted when he came to the United States as a nuncio. He was not demoted. He was uh, he was Benedict's right hand man. He was and sent Benedict on a mission. Said, Go find out what this whole thing is about. Go find out who's doing what. And I will give you a hundred percent of my my uh, backing. Just go do that. And when Benedict did that, that's when the end of Benedict was starting. They said, uh oh, he's coming really, really close. We got to get him out of here. And that's when they started putting pressure on everybody there and said that you have to go. And McCarrick was saying, if you're going to do that to me, I'm going to do this to you. Yes. Yes. And that's the, and the St. Gallen Mafia with Martini, Daniels, Casper. Those were the people who grind the gears and made the machine push Benedict out of the papacy. All for the amount of power and money. Yep. Yep. The idols, the idols, not Jesus Christ. We're going to worship idols. So when I was addicted to stupid things, I used to, uh, so I was worshiping, uh, idols. I was worshiping the alcohol or the drugs or the money that I was pursuing. And did I have any pure thoughts at that time? Absolutely not. None. I was, uh, I was, I was a crazy out of control man. And my parents were just 
beside themselves. How could this happen to my son? How can anybody be like so bad like this? He was never like that. And now I've changed back. Started at age 33, I'm now 60. And I tell you, I don't want to change my life back to that stuff. I want, uh, I want to be enlightened every single day. You know, it's, it's, it's important for me. I get the help. What would, you say to, what would you say to people who are hurting that are victims? Maybe there's, there's, there's probably dozens of victims of McCarrick out there, wouldn't you say, James? Yes, yes there are. I would, they're, I would and they're probably going to watch this. I would, I'd say that it's time for you to walk forward. If you can't speak to them, speak to me. You know how to contact me. So, so listen, yep. you know, James, uh, I, I can contact James in a nanosecond uh, and it'd be no problem at all about, and he would love to talk to you and I would be compassionate. Yes. And I would listen. The greatest gift I have gotten, I have received from God is my ability to listen, understand, and can be compassionate and to help another human being through what they're going through. Because... I struggle at times, but near, not nearly as much as I used to. And I have a, a, a gentleman who uh, lives close to me here who was abused in, in Philadelphia. And he and I are both by a, priest. Uh, by a priest, yes. And he and I are both in the recovery program. And we hang out together now and uh, do incredible things with each other. We have a lot of fun. But we have serious times where we have to think about stuff but we help each other out every single day. And we'll go out and find other people who are struggling, whether they're in it with a recovery or struggling with anything in their lives. And we reach out to them because we're not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid. I'm What's the biggest, the biggest obstacle, obstacle for people who were abused and they don't want to come out and say anything? Was there something that allowed you to make that move and say, this happened to me? I was afraid of McCarrick. I was afraid that if I said that he was going to end my life, he was going to rip me apart in the media. He was going to have people come and visit me, which he did have when I first came out. Uh, I've now have uh, protection. And uh, which is good. Uh, in fact, he's across the street right now. And uh, so still today, um, that's he has long tentacles. And he has lots of people in lots of places. And you have to be wary of that. And you have to watch everything that's going on. And that's the danger of speaking. Just like with some of the left wing agendas people. You have to be able, you, you can't come out and say their names because if you do, they're going to come after you. So yeah. the fright, the fear. So when he became, so I have to actually thank deeply. I have to thank Cardinal Dolan for saying those words. We have found credible evidence against this man. Oh, thank be to God. So he was the first saint who made it public. And so then that's when got the ball rolling. Someone else was, I can jump onto this bandwagon. But when, my, but when I had my lawyer come to my house, I explained to Mr. Noaker, I said, you know, if I speak, it's all going down. He goes, well, yeah, I really want to get this guy. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. It's all going to go. Everything. And so, can you handle that? Because it's all going to go. Did you say that before or after Vigano? I'm just curious. Before. Yeah. So you were right. This was back on July 10th, before I even hit uh, the, the, Wash, uh, the New York Times. So... Um, so I just watched the dominoes fall. And I thank God that, you know, when I meditate every day, I, I hear different, uh, God's telling me different things. And I, I pray about them. And then the next day I read them on the, on the internet. I go, wow, that was fast. So there are many things happening. And 
So how can I not be a believe in God? I have to believe in God because as my friend Dominic says to me, for the last 49 years, Jesus has been taking bullets for me. I have to be able to, to, to repay him. And I have to start to talk without fear. And without the fear, then it's uh, the, my thoughts go into someone else's ears and they go, aha. And that's how it all starts. It's incredible. It is incredible. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I have to pinch myself. Okay, what is really happening here? Well, I've also yeah, in saw- the last few months, you've been on a miraculous journey. Yes, I have. Um, in the last few months, I started reading the Bible on a, on a regular basis. And I found a gentleman Amen. who can, uh, uh, who has read it and knows it very, very well. He's not a Catholic guy, but that's okay. He, uh, he knows the Bible very, very well. He, he tells me which, where to go and what to read. He says, what you should do next is uh, I want you to read uh, the book of James. How, how, how appropriate is that? And just go look at uh, James chapter 5 about how their clothes are starting to become, uh, you know, fragments. And how uh, all, their, all their gold and silver are being tarnished. And uh, start to do that. And... Uh, he thinks that I should write something, uh, put it out there before the February uh, hmm. meeting, and so that they have to answer these questions. And so I could just wait for them to answer the questions. And so I'm working on that. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a brilliant, brilliant idea. idea. Yeah. And so then I can. What did you think when, when Supage was appointed to that February meeting? Well, I had to say words that are not allowed to say on on, uh, on public. Uh, <laughs> I was saddened. To be true, I'm saddened because I'm not sure if that I can trust that man. I can't trust him. Um, but France is it true that he me. received his cardinal's hat because of McCarrick's influence? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, car, I mean, every cardinal that uh, is in in good graces with Francis is McCarrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all going to go it's down. Amazing. It seems every month there are new explosions, new fireworks, new landmines, and who knows what's what's ahead of us. It's it's amazing. It's uh, so you and I talk every single day, or you and I uh, get out there and uh, try to convey to somebody else. Somebody else watches your uh, your blog, watches this uh, this video, and new thoughts happen. I just happened to go across your uh, your your <laughs> Vatican Bank thing, and I just oh, it just blew up in my mind. And so we ha- we are looking for other saints along the line. We need other saints to just speak out as soon as possible. Not that time is running out, but uh, it needs to stay in front. And if Trump wasn't president of the United States, we'd be on the front page every single day. But I'm glad he's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, James, this has been explosive two things stand out to me the most important thing and i think everyone watching this this is gonna be a very popular video is the testimony of your faith in the lord jesus christ second person of the trinity the things that have happened to you the childhood that was robbed in ways an unknowing betrayal of your own family to you decades later not just returning to christ but taking the, it, to be honest, it's a little bit scary to go on a camera or to go in front of people and to say, these things happened to me. And there's this powerful man who did it. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is your knowledge of the history of McCarrick's life, his timeline, the role of St. Gallen, and this evil web of cardinals, archbishops, and bishops who are covering for one another, receiving those white envelopes. That's a wake up call. Yes. 
Yes, it is. So this is only happening because uh, you and I got to talk today. Amen. And uh, for the last 27 years in my recovery program, I've been learning how to speak in front of other human beings and not have fear. You speak from your heart. God brings us a thought into here, and I get to speak his words. And that's what I've been practicing for a long period of time. That's how come I got to be able to do uh, speak in Baltimore. And how I was able to take an interview uh, with EWTN and come today. I don't have fear anymore. He's in Kansas. That's right. That's right. And it's God's well, God word. bless you. Thank you. It's fantastic. I just encourage everyone out there. I like to actually close a prayer if you're okay with that, James. But if you're a victim inside the church, outside the church, I hope that this inspires you. I hope it gives you comfort, especially those who have been abused by clergy. James is just such a great hero and example. So thank you for that, James. And um, at the end of this video, I'm going to put up two videos that are related the ones that James referred to. One is on the St. Gallen Mafia. The other one is on Pope Benedict, Vigano, and the Vatican Bank. Because we talked a lot about it, James. Maybe some people haven't seen that information. So I'll, I'll link that at the end of this video oh, very good. as well. And before we close, is there any final statements? Any things you want to say? Challenges, encouragements? I would like that the, uh, that all the, cardinals and the bishops stop what they're doing and go talk to your people this Sunday about who Jesus Christ is and how they can become better Catholics and understand that abortion is no good, that homosexuality is no good, and that we must find the sacred heart of Jesus and work to be better human beings and help each other. Beautiful words. Beautiful words. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for James Grine. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to comfort his heart, strengthen him, preserve him, and protect him with all of your angels. We pray for all victims that you would also bring healing to them, reconciliation, and mercy. And we pray for our church that you would liberate it from all the sin and evil and help our church to guide us to Jesus Christ, your son. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. St. James, pray for us. James Grind, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, John. We really appreciate you. I really appreciate you also. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right.